Welcome to the Speaking of Women's Health podcast. I'm back in the Sunflower House. I'm Dr. Holly Thacker, the Executive Director of Speaking of Women's Health. And today's podcast episode is what breast cancer survivors need to know as women. Certainly, breast cancer is a common fear amongst women. Most all of us know someone in our own personal family or friend circles who have dealt with breast cancer. And thankfully, the therapies of treating breast cancer have improved markedly. And most women with breast cancer don't die from breast cancer. They die from other causes, just like any other woman. So it's very important to have a survival mentality and to know what things to have to deal with, to be proactive, to be strong, be healthy, and be in charge. Now, one of the more common problems in postmenopausal women in general, and certainly in women who've been treated for breast cancer, particularly if they were premenopausal and had to have their hormone levels stopped either medically, chemically, through chemotherapy, or even surgically with removal of the ovaries. And even in postmenopausal women being treated for postmenopausal breast cancer, there is a common condition called GSM, or genitourinary syndrome of menopause. Now, we previously used to term this vaginal atrophy, but it really didn't capture the entire condition. Some would refer it to as vulvovaginal atrophy, meaning the vulva, the labia, the clitoris, the opening of the vagina, and the vagina. An older medical term was carosis vulvae, which is itching of the vulva from the thinness. The part of the body that has the most hormone receptors, ER alpha and ER beta, is the vulva, the lower half of the vagina, the entire urethra, which is the tube that urine comes out, and the base of the bladder. So a few years ago, the term GSM was more comprehensively used as a term to not just describe the problems with the vagina and the vulva, but also with the bladder and the urethra. Many women will develop bladder infections or overactive bladder, which we'll talk about more in upcoming podcast. The reason why women that are breast cancer survivors, especially those that have received and are receiving anti-estrogen therapy, specifically the aromatase inhibitors, they tend to suffer from the dryness, the itching, the irritation, dyspareunia, which is painful sexual activity, and dysuria, which is burning on urination. So all these symptoms together collectively are known as GSM. And GSM can really decrease the quality of life. And sadly, it's undertreated by breast cancer oncologists in some patients for fear of breast cancer recurrence, specifically when they are considering treatment with vaginal estrogen therapy. In general, vaginal estrogen therapy is not, uh, there's not much systemic absorption, particularly after the vagina tissue is re-epithelialized and is healthy and thick and strong. Certainly in the first few days to a week or so of treatment, there can be some detectable estrogen levels. But that being said, there's other non-estrogen treatments, and I like to be proactive and see women and prevent the symptoms from happening in the first place. Now, GSM has nearly unanimously impacted the life of many breast cancer survivors, especially those women who were younger when they had their treatment, had chemotherapy, radiation, or so-called adjuvant endocrine hormonal ablative therapies, such as with aromatase inhibitors like Arimidex or Letrozole or Aromacin. Those are some of the common uh, prescription names. Now, tamoxifen, which is a very old cancer drug, and it also prevents cancer, um, 
is a little different. That's an estrogen receptor agonist antagonist. And in some women, actually, tamoxifen has estrogen-like effects on the vagina and bladder, which can be helpful. And even the uterus and endometrium. Um, So in women over 50 on tamoxifen, there is a 1% increased risk of endometrial cancer. So usually the women on the aromatase inhibitors have more GSM. The common adverse effects of breast cancer therapy, uh, which many times, not always, but many times involves decreasing or totally obliterating the levels of estrogen, can really cause the tissues of the vulva, the lining of the bladder, the vagina to become thinner, drier, less elastic. And these physiologic changes can lead to injury or tearing or pain or even unbearable symptoms such as burning, itching, uh, possible discharge, and recurrent urinary tract infections. But the good news is these symptoms can be prevented and or certainly treated, and the sooner the better. So arm yourself if you're a breast cancer survivor, or maybe you have a friend or sister or someone who's suffering in silence. There's many ways to treat GSM after breast cancer, and certainly local estrogen therapy is one of the most common approaches. GSM is usually reversible with hormone therapy, locally in the vagina alone in the vulva, and sometimes we even use it systemically if needed. And furthermore, there are other non-estrogen treatments that can treat GSM in all women and certainly in breast cancer survivors, and that includes DHEA, or vaginal precursor steroids. Intrarosa is vaginal DHEA in the 0.5%, used nightly to treat vaginal dryness, and is available by prescription. I have been prescribing compounded, higher-strength 1% vaginal DHEA for 15 years based on a publication in the Journal of Menopause uh, by Dr. Labrie, who extensively studied the local effects in the vaginal tissue of DHEA, which inside the cells is converted to estrogen and testosterone without boosting any systemic levels. And if a woman has a uterus and endometrium or endometriosis, the lining of those endometrial cells cannot make any sex hormones. So you can put a lot of vaginal DHEA in the vagina and you won't affect the uterus. Whereas if you put a bunch of estrogen cream up against the cervix and the uterus, there is a 10% chance of stimulation of the lining of the uterus, just like with systemic estrogen or just like with systemic oral DHEA, which when swallowed and goes to the stomach and the liver can get converted to sex hormones. So even if you're a woman who has had estrogen receptor positive breast cancer, you need to know their treatment options. Now, I remind you, this is not medical advice. This is a health education empowerment podcast to help you and your family and friends be strong, be healthy, and be in charge. Now, based on a public uh, published study that surveyed breast oncologist attitudes, those are doctors that specialize in cancer treatment, towards the diagnosis and treatment of GSM. The main reasons why many of them did not offer or prescribe local vaginal estrogen therapy and their breast cancer survivor patients were fear of possible breast cancer recurrence, which is always a possibility even decades later, regardless of if GSM is treated or not. The possible interference with the treatments, such as the aromatase inhibitors, particularly if used in high doses, and unfortunately, fear of medical litigation. Know that there are effective treatments for GSM. Now, first-line therapies that are not hormonal can include lubricants, but that doesn't actually treat or reverse the GSM. But water-based lubricants, silicon-based lubricants, and just good old natural olive oil and vitamin E oil also can be moisturizers and lubricants. Now, some of the water-based products are products that you can buy over the counter like Astroglide and Flemglide and Just Like Me or Preseed or Slippery Stuff, KY Jelly. 
Some of the silicon-based products can include things like ID Millennium, Pink, Pijor, Pure, Pure Pleasure. Um, in general, we avoid all mineral oil and most oil-based products, but externally using olive oil on the genitals, male or female, is fine, as is vitamin E oil. Now, there's some interesting vaginal uh, moisturizers uh, that help keep the vagina moist, like Replens or KY Silky, uh, KY Liquid Beads, Moist Again. Um, one of the most helpful vaginal moisturizers, which is not a hormone, is hyaluronic acid. And as you might mention, remember, we talked about hyaluronic acid as a great skin plumper of the face and the neck for aging for women in our um, skin care and skin esthetician earlier podcast that we did. Well, you can use hyaluronic acid in the vagina and it actually seems to, even though it's not a hormone, help some of the epithelial effects and help um, the vagina's pH. Now, there are several different brands. They can all be purchased over the counter. Uh, Reverie is one that I know some of my patients have used. But again, uh, many of the time, this does not reverse the thinning and the dryness. And when you use local estrogen or local DHEA, that helps thicken up the tissue. It helps improve blood flow. It helps uh, uh, maintain nerve sensitivity. So for decades, we've had Premer and Vaginal Cream, which has 10 different estrogens in it and affects both the alpha and the beta estrogen receptors. Now, women who just only want pure estradiol, the human estrogen, Vaginal Esterase Cream can be used locally. Generally, when we use vaginal estrogen, we use it every day for a couple of weeks and if the woman is severely distressed and thin. But the general maintenance dose is just twice a week with the creams. And the nice thing is you can smear it on the vulva. Now, a string vaginal ring um, has been on the market for a couple of decades, and it's a silastic ring with natural estrogen, and it only treats the vagina, not the vulva, not the cervix, if the cervix is atrophic, but there's no systemic absorption, and the ring itself lasts for three months. There's no messy creams to insert, and that has been studied in breast cancer survivors. Vagifem is an estrogen tablet that's inserted into the lower part, lower half to one-third of the vagina, every night for two weeks, and then twice a week, and there's now a generic UVFM tablet. Sometimes, though, the tablet in some women doesn't totally dissolve, and there is a new vaginal insert called Invexi, which has coconut oil and two very low doses of natural estrogen, uh, 10 micrograms, and even the lowest dose, 4 micrograms, which some breast cancer survivors or some women who are very sensitive and have extensive pelvic endometriosis might like. And that can be inserted day or night, doesn't need an applicator, and has the natural extra coconut oil moisturization. Now, I mentioned earlier that intravaginal DHEA has no estrogen in it and many times is more effective than estrogen because it also boosts testosterone. Estrogen receptor antagonist, also known as estrogen uh, ERAAs, um, which tamoxifen is one, and that's taken by mouth to treat and prevent breast cancer. There was uh, several studied uh, in terms of breast and bone health, and Avista, raloxifen, is used to prevent and treat osteoporosis and also has the FDA-approved indication to reduce estrogen-positive breast cancer, but has no effects on the vagina. But there is another ERR, ERAA, called ospemethin or osphena, which is a non-estrogen oral medicine taken daily with food to get better absorption that is FDA approved to treat GSM and vaginal atrophy, although it has not specifically been studied in breast cancer. But breast cancer survivors who are past their treatment, who might not want to use creams or inserts or vaginal rings, it's still important to know what all your options are. 
Now, um, women that have stage zero breast cancer, also known as DCIS, or women who are at high risk for breast cancer but don't really have any active breast cancer, who are interested in taking menopausal hormones, uh, many times we prefer estrogen alone or a um, non-progestin uterine protection. And we used to have Duave available, which had basidoxifene in it, another ERAA. Unfortunately, currently at this time, I'm recording this in May of 2023, it has not been on the market since the pandemic. It was available for a few years before then and was certainly a favorite of many of my patients because it did not affect the breast. Uh, Whenever you want the most up-to-date information after you listen to one of our podcasts, be sure to go on our website, speakingofwomenshealth.com, because we post breaking health news, and you can use the search a button you could put in Duave. And if Duave is ever back on the market, believe me, I will be putting that on the website. And there certainly are some breast cancer survivors who are young and have not had pregnancy or want more pregnancies who go on to pregnancy and have uh, and are not prevented from having that. And many of them have the same or better outcomes than counterparts who don't go on to have pregnancy and high, high estrogen levels. So whenever I get a history of breast cancer, I always want to know, um, did they take away your estrogen? What was the exact tumor type? How are you treated? What was your oncotype uh, DX score, which tells us what your recurrence rate was? If you had estrogen-negative breast cancer and were treated and no one took away your estrogen just because you live long enough to go into menopause and be one of those 50 to 80% of women who then get GSM, uh, regardless of breast cancer status, uh, it doesn't seem fair to just withhold treatment from you. There is an excellent podcast by one of my graduated fellows on YouTube, and also you can get it through our website and also via menopauselearning.com. Dr. Heather Hirsch and breast cancer oncologist Dr. Avram Blooming. And uh, he has treated women with breast cancer for years, and then when his wife got breast cancer and suffered with symptoms, uh, boy, did he... um, pay a lot more attention and wake up and really uh, do a lot more research into this area and change his tune. So any woman who is a breast cancer survivor who has been offered local treatment or even systemic treatment and is fearful of these recommendations, that is a must-listen-to video interview. So how might you go about choosing the right GSM treatment for you? Well, when selecting it, you want to know these factors. What's the hormone exposure, local or systemic? Uh, do you have a uterus or endometrium? Is there any postmenopausal bleeding? If it's from the uterus, it's got to be evaluated. Most postmenopausal bleeding is just from the atrophy and the thinness and the need for treatment. Is there a hysterectomy? Um, always get your surgical reports and your pathology reports. It's very important to keep hard copies of, of major surgeries. What's your bone status? Have you have a bone density? Do you have osteoporosis or osteopenia? Have you broken any bones over age 40? Did any biological relative of yours break a hip, particularly under age 85? Um, Is your breast cancer estrogen receptor positive or negative? And have you had genetic testing uh, for um, breast cancer? Is there a family history of breast and ovarian cancer or other cancers like colon cancer, pancreas cancer, brain cancer. We'll be back after a quick break. Hey, quick question for you. Are you someone who wants to be fit, healthy, and happy? And what if I told you you could get your dream body by simply just listening to a podcast? I'm Josh. And I'm KG, and we are the hosts of the Fit, Healthy, and Happy podcast. Listen, we get it. Fitness isn't easy. Carbs, no carbs. Just stop, okay? It doesn't have to be that complicated. And that's why we made this podcast. We get straight to the facts so you can become your best you. So the way to check us out is click the link in the show notes or search Fit, Healthy, and Happy podcast on any of the major podcast platforms. We'll see you soon. Uh, It's very important to know your biological relative's um, medical history, if at all possible. Um, And in terms of experiencing menopause after breast cancer, many times 
chemotherapy can cause an earlier menopause, particularly in women who are 45 or older. And chemotherapy can certainly influence the onset of menopause. Some women stop periods or start getting irregular periods. Some uh, chemotherapy uh, used directly damages the ovary, uh, resulting in premature menopause. So women who've not had children or who are very young definitely want consultation to preserve fertility. Some women may want to freeze eggs, um, and it's actually probably more effective to be able to freeze embryos, which unfortunately, of course, a lot of women don't know who their future father of their children uh, may be, but embryos are definitely hardier than just um, eggs. Um, when chemotherapy begins, um, some women may notice uh, menopausal symptoms, uh, but some symptoms can be delayed for a long time, depending on the adrenal reserve and the ovarian reserve. But in general, the older a person is, when they get chemo, the more likely it is to induce menopause. Um, menstrual cycles can flow can be very different. It's always important, whether you're worried about pregnancy or not, to always keep a menstrual uh, record because sometimes it's hard with everything going on in your life to recall what your bleeding pattern really is. Um, sometimes the period uh, takes uh, is a longer cycle or a lighter cycle. Some women might not have any change at all. Some women may have a Mirena IUD, which they may not have periods anyway. It doesn't mean their ovaries aren't working. And in that case, hormone levels may need to be done. Some women have had endometrial ablations, uh, which generally I'm not a big fan of. And I've talked about this in my podcast when I podcasted my book, The Cleveland Clinic Guide to Menopause, especially one of the later chapters on heavy and abnormal bleeding. So if you are thinking about having an ablation or doing something about heavy bleeding, please go and listen to that podcasted chapter. You might want to ask, well, when will your periods return after chemo? Uh, and it's sometimes hard to predict. Uh, I've seen women who've not had a period and it looks like they're in menopause. And a year or two later, once they're healthy and feeling better and recovered from their treatment, boom, their periods come back. Uh, so generally, as a woman ages um, and is chronologically used or closer to the age of menopause, which is in general 51 to 52 years of age, it's more likely that it will be permanent. So you might wonder, after I've completed chemo, how long do I have to wait before I can try to get pregnant if you're a young woman? Generally speaking, pregnancies after chemo are not um, uncommon, but they do need special planning. So you need to consult with your obstetrician, your breast oncology physician, and um, most of the time, pregnancy will not influence the return of cancer. In fact, in a, a large um, cohort study, women that had estrogen-negative breast cancer who later got pregnant seemed to have better outcomes than those who had um, not gotten pregnant, whereas those with estrogen-positive breast cancer who got pregnant uh, didn't seem to fare any worse than those with estrogen-positive breast cancer who didn't get pregnant. Um, sometimes there are certain situations where pregnancy might need to be considered with a bit more caution, so it's got to be individualized, and you may want to be seen at a specialty tertiary center. But you need to be reassured that many young women who get treated for breast cancer can still go on and become pregnant, and it's not prohibited in general to get pregnant if you are a breast cancer survivor. So that, I think, is excellent news. You might wonder, are there risk of chromosomal abnormalities or cancer in children in women conceived after chemo? In general, the answer is no. Uh, we're not aware of any known chromosomal abnormalities in a woman's child after she's had chemo. I've even seen women who've had chemo during their pregnancies and have gone on to have healthy children. Um, so follow-up after breast cancer treatment is very important. The American Cancer Society says if you've completed treatment for breast cancer, you need to see your doctor regularly. You need to also look for any late effects from cancer treatment. You need a breast cancer survivor guide that looks at your general health, your cardiovascular health, your bone health, 
your genitourinary and sexual health, as well as just other cancer screenings, be it breast, be it skin cancer, colon cancer, cervical cancer. I mean, some people just want to put it behind them and they don't want to see the doctor and be reminded of what they went through. And that's really unfortunate because there are preventable medical conditions and cancers that need to be screened for. If you've not had both your breasts surgically removed, uh, which most women don't, you still need regular mammograms. And it is reassuring to know that most breast cancer survivors don't get breast cancer again, but they may be at risk for getting some types of cancer. And the most common second cancer in breast cancer survivors is actually another breast cancer. And tamoxifen can significantly lower the chance of hormone receptor positive breast cancer coming back, as well as getting a second breast cancer. It does, especially in women over 50, increase the risk of endometrial uterine cancer and uterine sarcoma. And so if there's any abnormal bleeding, that has to be immediately evaluated. And in general, any woman over 40 who has a change in her bleeding pattern or is abnormal should be evaluated. But the risk of uterine cancer in most women taking tamoxifen is low. So for most people, the benefits outweigh the risk. So tips to help lower your risk of cancer in general, please do not smoke or use nicotine. Get recommended screenings. It's very important to stay at a healthy weight and eat a nutritious a Mediterranean-based diet that's colorful with fruits and vegetables and all the phytochemicals which are uh, good at helping to reduce cancer and heart disease. Avoid highly processed foods, sugary foods. And it's really best not to drink alcohol or certainly not have more than three to five drinks maximum per week. Sometimes I slip up when I'm talking to patients. I say, no more than three to five drinks per day, and their eyes pop open. Certainly no woman should ever have more than two drinks of alcohol per day because we women don't metabolize alcohol in the stomach. We don't have the alcohol dehydrogenase enzyme that men do. So if a woman drinks two drinks a day, that's like a man drinking four drinks a day. And there is no safe level of alcohol in terms of cancer risk. So you need to understand that. Also, you should take vitamin D3 with K2. If you're over 40, if you live in a northern climate, if you're overweight, um, the darker your skin is, you've got built-in sunscreen, all of these are factors that can make you much more at risk for low vitamin D levels. And I encourage you, if you haven't listened to my second podcast on vitamin D, that one is a winner because there are many cancers that are reduced with uh, maintaining a good vitamin D level and good nutrition. It's also important to get regular sleep because sleep disruption may also increase several medical conditions, including lowering your immune system and affecting cancer risk. So if you're a breast cancer survivor or you were just diagnosed with breast cancer and feeling overwhelmed or you have family or friends who've dealt with it, please be empowered to know you have a lot of options. In general, most people's prognosis is good. There's been so many exciting advances in the area of metastatic breast cancer, which is like the most severe type of breast cancer. And there's been breakthroughs almost on a daily basis from a pharmacogenetic standpoint. And we will cover some of these topics in future podcasts. I want to thank you for joining me in the Sunflower House, talking uh, in depth about genitourinary syndrome in breast cancer survivors and all the options that women have. Please subscribe to our podcast if you don't already subscribe. Uh, If you've got to this podcast from our free monthly e-newsletter on Speaking of Women's Health, which you can go on and click and subscribe for free and get a a newsletter and health tip from us once a month, please do that if you don't get it. But if you're just gone to the website to get the podcast, you can just get it on any of your free podcast apps like um, iTunes or Google Podcast or Amazon Music or Podbean 
or Spotify, really anywhere that you listen to any other podcast. So please subscribe. And after you've listened to a couple of our podcasts, please give us a five-star rating. That helps us move up in the rankings. And if you're a breast cancer survivor, you may want to listen to our free medical CME, even if you're not a physician, because we go into depth on the candy neuron inhibitors, which are an excellent um, emerging therapy that we hope to have on the market very soon to treat hot flashes. Because GSM is the most common uh, post-breast cancer uh, issue that women deal with, but Hot flashes and bone loss are right up there. And we have an excellent uh, podcast for physicians on osteoporosis with Dr. Christy Tuff DeSapri. And also, I podcasted my book, The Cleveland Clinic Guide to Menopause. Uh, and there was an excellent podcast and update on all the different therapies to prevent and treat osteoporosis. So, you are armed to be strong, be healthy and be in charge and I look forward to you joining me again in the Sunflower House for future podcasts.